proof, but uh, this is really, this problem is a pleasure to be talking about because uh, it's, it's kind of like very easy to sell in a sense. Uh, the problem statement is uh, kind of like clear. Um, and uh, then like our contribution is also kind of not that hard to phrase. Okay, so long story short, uh, so first of all, the outline. So we'll be talking about online portfolio selection today. I will first present the framework um, of online portfolio selection that was introduced in co by cover in the beginning of 90s. Uh, then I will briefly give some intuition about his algorithm that claimed that that was like a milestone in solving the problem. Uh, and in some sense, we can claim uh, in some very specific sense, we can claim the first improvement over his algorithm since uh, the moment it was introduced, despite a very, despite uh, vigorous activity on the topic, especially in the past few years. So um, then I will present our result proper. So I will talk what this, you know, what the contribution is and uh, um, off offset it against covers algorithm perhaps. Um, very briefly try to sketch the sketch of the proof. Um, and then finally, we will discuss if the time remains, which is not promised at all, but if it remains, I will discuss some prospects. Um, yes. Um, so, okay, so let's go. What this uh, online portfolio selection refers to? Online portfolio selection, or as I call it also, universal portfolios, um, which is not the way the term was introduced. So Cover, when he introduced the term, because his contribution was also the algorithm to do universal portfolios in a sense, that's why they, he called his algorithm universal portfolios. But for me, uh, let me say that online portfolio selection, when you think about it, you can also think about universal portfolio selection or universal online portfolio selection. Okay, so what this is about. So 30 years ago, Thomas Cover proposed a protocol for periodic investment and discrete time, periodic trade trading, you can say. Here's the protocol. The protocol is really, now this is what I will really require for you to understand. And this is uh, where some people stumble, as it turns out, not familiar with the framework. The framework is for each discrete time period T, the raising period from one to capital T, capital T is the horizon. You as a trader, okay, select, a distribution, discrete distribution on D outcomes, which is your unit wealth that you re redistribute over D possible assets. Okay, so much so good as in the classical, you know, portfolio selection, Alia Markovitz. Uh, then what happens is that in the end of this period, as soon as WT is already selected, you receive the new state of the market. So the new asset returns, the vector of asset returns that are positive. It's a positive vector, vector with positive entries. Otherwise, it's completely unrestricted. No magnitude restriction, nothing. Uh, so it's positive because, okay, so because we think that the market is growing, but also because if it's not growing, it's, it can be reduced to the growth situation. So it's not that interesting. Market is growing, we are optimists here. Then as soon as the XT is returned, we suffer the loss, which is the minus logarithm of the inner product between XT transpose WT. Why is minus the log? It's easy to understand for those who, who, for whom it's not that intuitive. Well, uh, it's a multiplicative model of returns, right? So it's like returns is a, mul a multiplicative thing. It's like percentages of growth. Then XT transpose WT is our aggregate, ret aggregate yes, return. Uh, of our portfolio, right? Because we average portfolio over the assets and XT are their prices. So XT transpose WT is the return of our portfolio. Now the loss that we suffer, well, why the loss? It's because, uh, you know, because of, let's say my Russian mentality that tells me that I'm always suffering the loss instead of gaining, gaining the advantage. So uh, this is why it's minus low, okay? Um, and also because I like to work with, with convex functions rather than concave functions. But the point is that then if you sum up this minus logs, you will get the log of the well, minus log of the uh, exponential, right? And this exponential is your cumulative return that you get after all these trading periods because the returns multiplied. Okay, so this is, uh, this is why we use this logarithmic loss function. This is completely natural, uh, right? So um, this... Uh, sum of LT of WT would be the cumulative log loss. And from 
this no, no moment on, I, I will emit the log, but always the loss is the log loss. Uh, so is a cumulative loss. Then the goal is to find a strategy that keeps this cumulative loss as small as possible uh, over capital T runs. Dimitri, now, Dimitri yes. Yes. I just want to confirm. So the portfolio WT is actually the portfolio from T minus one to T, yes? Oh, uh, that's a good point. So uh, it's, it's, it's a notation, uh, it's a notation like subtlety. Uh, so WT uses the context X, X taus from taus, uh, for taus from one to T minus one. Okay, yes, yeah, that's what I want to confirm. Yes. yes, this is probably, yes, this is what you meant. So I, and I'm sorry, it's always this kind of T, T minus one problem, but uh, you know, uh, any option you take, there will be problem with what you lose. So, um, so yes, so uh, WT doesn't, the point is that WT doesn't know anything about XT. Yet somehow you manage to be competitive with this adversarial market. That will uh, seem like a miracle probably for people who are not uh, familiar with the framework or with online learning. So let's go. So let's, let's, let me state what is the, the, the target of the algorithm really. Uh, what is the performance measure of any algorithm? So in this framework. Okay, so what is the algorithm? Algorithm is, you can think about only iterative algorithms and then algorithm is simply is the rule of choosing the next WT. Uh, giving the previous history up, up to t minus one, or tau up to t minus one, okay? Then the goal is to select wt, the next wt, that gives a large cumulative return, or that means small cumulative logarithmic loss, because the two are monotonally, monotonally connected, monotonally related. Now, the question is really, what is the baseline? So clearly, because what happens is that, remember, there is no underlying stochastic model of the market. I don't assume XT is coming from the same distribution or from a you know, slowly evolving distribution, nothing like that. WT are completely adversarial and the market really does observe WT before uh, it is allowed to choose uh, XT in a sense. So the market really knows WT, it can punish us with its XT, with its return prices, completely like, you know, against our portfolios. So uh, it seems that we cannot do anything. Well, we clearly cannot do anything if we compare uh, with the best sequence of portfolio selections. Okay, so this is a very strong baseline to compare with. So what they do in online learning and online portfolio selection, they say, okay, let's compare with the best uh, static strategy, uh, which they also call CRP, or constantly rebalanced portfolio. This was the original formulation by Cover. So he says, okay, so let's compare. So our regret for any algorithm A uh, and for the market X1 for capital T. Uh, so do you see my pointer? I'm sorry, do you see, do you guys see my pointer? Yes. The mouse point. Okay, so the regret of, of any for any algorithm A is the, the cumulative loss uh, for the sequence of portfolios that was chosen against the minimal possible cumulative loss, but over the static sequence for, for the best in hindsight static sequence. So on one hand, we are comparing with something best in hindsight, which is great. On the other hand, we compare with something static, whereas the, the, the kind of the framework is dynamic, which seems to be a bit weird. Uh, and honestly, to me it was, uh, except that first of all, it will really, well, there, is, there are some motivations why this actually makes sense, surprisingly. One motivation is that it actually works really great in practice. So uh, in particular, universal portfolios have very good performance on actual when the actual market uh, markets are like market data sets uh, are, are fed. Uh, and we did try this. Uh, the other motivation is that actually now, if you assume, you know, that in a practical situation, XT will be coming from a slowly changing distribution, then uh, the, the static strategies will actually be great. Well, at least in the situation of stationary distribution, the static, uh, you can show that static strategy is nearly minimax. In some sense, it's nearly the best possible. And the problem is that uh, we are not knowing the static strategy in advance. So we kind of trying to find it in a dynamic way. Uh, 
Uh, and finally, you know, as a theorist, I'm not just, I, I might not just be concerned. It's, it's it, uh, with, with why this is useful. It's kind of, uh, it, it is simple enough. It gives me reasonable practical results. And on the other hand, it gives me a very well-rounded, st well-stated mathematical formulation where I can think about, when I can talk about the best possible solution, et cetera. Okay, so um, enough with this. So uh, I, I really try to convey why this adversarial setup is useful. Uh, this should be really understood that it's completely adversarial. Um, and you should please be keeping this in mind throughout the remaining remainder of the talk. Now, what kind of guarantees we want? Uh, we would like some guarantees that are uniformly over all possible markets, market behavior sex. So we need something in the right-hand side. Well, essentially, we need to have a bound, an upper bound on the supremum of this regret over all possible sequences, X1 through capital C, where each entry of the sequence is uh, in the positive order, is a vector in RD plus. Okay, so this is what we want, and this turns out to be achievable. And this, and the fact that it's achievable has been known since the early 90s. Uh, so in particular, so Cover in his seminal paper, Tom Cover uh, called any algorithm admitting such a bound universal, right? Universal because it works for any market, X1 for capital T. Uh, and uh, moreover, uh, it turns out that there are uh, universal algorithms with non-trivial regret guarantees. So first of all, what are, well, not exactly trivial, but let's say what are really, really weak regret guarantees, like really useless, basically. Those where the right-hand side will grow linearly with capital T. Because, right, essentially, it's like, if we do something really silly that is completely non-adaptive to the market, we will kind of like lose in every step. And we'll just keep losing in every step because we kind of like not keeping up with what the market really wants from us. Uh, so really in online learning in general, and in this problem in particular, we would want something that is sublinear in capital T. Uh, and then final remark that I will say is that it's really, we, we really think about capital T as something large enough. Uh, it doesn't have to go to infinity as I kind of jargon, like wrote it in, in a like sloppy way. Uh, capital T will always be finite throughout, but like capital T is at least as big as D, uh, which kind of makes sense because you really uh, would like to first observe the whole market at least once. No, not the whole market, I'm sorry. Uh, any asset should appear at least once in some sense, okay? Uh, there are some other explanations of why this is useful, but uh, I will not I will not go over them. We can discuss hey, explain. Excuse me, can I yes. ask questions? Yes, yes. Could you go back to the yes. previous? So first, uh, uh, your, the setting is random, yes? No. So the X size, no. Uh, they are no, they are not random. Oh. You take supremum okay. over them. And I'm sorry, at this point, I cannot explain. I mean, I can try explaining, but I don't have a better words. But like, let me just once again emphasize. So uh -huh. here, regret itself here on the left-hand side. So the way I wrote it, XTs are hidden inside of LT, right? LT yeah. is a function parameterized by XT. LT is mm -hmm. minus log of WT in the product with XT. Right. Great. Now am I, I am allowed to take supremum over this XTs. Okay. Yeah, I'm somehow I'm somehow managing to uh, to give. This is why the, the algorithm is called universal because it will really work with some given guarantees for any possible market. And this is also the reason why Cover's paper has 900 citations because people before him he, they did not realize that this is possible in this community in the financial community. Whereas somehow people in in online learning this is pretty much what they do. Uh -huh. And okay. I agree that this is a subtle mm -hmm. point. But we can discuss more. But let me just emphasize once again, XTs are completely adversarial, completely mm -hmm. adversarial, yet the regret guarantees are quite favorable. And we will see in a second like what they are, what the algorithm is. Okay. So and here another in terms of notation. So here you write as an algorithm A. And as a yes. right side, you mean the, the right side is a WT is a portfolio generated by that algorithm. That's yes. What, okay. Yes. Okay. Yeah, so uh, the algorithm is kind of just like a symbol for me here. So I will replace this A with two algorithms in, the, in, a, in what goes next and by cover, with cover, cover algorithms and our algorithm, okay? okay? Okay, so now let's look at cover's algorithm. 
so Kavar's algorithm relies on a very kind of simple prototypical idea, which is follow the leader. Follow the leader says, okay, so if we if uh, we are trying to find the best CRP, so the best constant rebalance portfolio in hindsight, this is our ultimate goal. Uh, let's try to play at each step. Uh, I'm sorry, so in this case, so uh, for what goes next, before, before specified later at some specific point, I will choose WT plus one. So T becomes T plus one, but don't be overly concerned with this. Uh, so, uh, so essentially I just shifted the indexes by, by one, but there is no mathematical meaning, it's just a notational convention. So algorithm chooses WT plus one, given the history up to T, including T. So um, follow the leader approach, that's the idea that says, okay, so let me just play the best CRP for what I have observed so far. So if I observed so far, uh, the cumulative loss, but only up to the moment T, so let me find the best CRP for what I observed so far. And I will just play it. It seems reasonable. It's kind of like I'm trying to keep up. So in the end, I will kind of choose, I will play uh, the best portfolio for like all the steps, except the, 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 you know, the final one. And then maybe at the next step, I will actually even find my, my WT, but I, I kind of lack the, the final bit of history for this. And even if I do, the point is that I already paid the prices uh, corresponding to the selected W tau's, because at step tau I selected W tau and not, and not the final best one, not the best one in hindsight. So it turns out that per se this idea doesn't work; it is broken. Uh, so and it's kind of very easy to to come up with a sequence, you know, with the market that breaks it. The market is in R two is just alternates between two assets. Okay, so you have uh, whatever you have uh, like oil and gas or whatever, something less sensitive. Uh, the point is that you will put all the prices in even rounds for the even asset and in the odd rounds for the odd asset. And if you look what happens, essentially you will just trick your WT plus one to track always the previous asset. And you will always put, penalize it by the next asset uh, and that's it. They, there is no non-trivial regard guarantee. So you can only prove something linearly growing with capital T. However, it turns out that the, you know, the idea has some, you know, has some meaning in it. Uh, and it turns out that you can actually mend it uh, to something that works and moreover to something that works very well. Uh, so the key trick is somehow robustify your selection procedure. And there are different ways to do it actually known overall. Uh, but the, the only way known to work here in this context was the one introduced, proposed by Cover himself in the same paper, uh, which is, so I will refer to it as Cover's algorithm. It's also known in the literature as universal portfolios. Uh, and it's actually also uh, what is called exponentially weighted average forecaster uh, in the online learning community. The algorithm is the following. So it says, okay, uh, it's, our selection will also be a functional of LT of W, of the functional T of W, but instead of taking its arg minimum, uh, what we will play, we will play uh, the average over certain distribution defined by W, by L, LT of W, capital, or sorry, squiggly LT of W. So more precisely, because you know LT is minus log of some exponential, so let's take the density, which is exponential of minus LT, the very natural. So let's take the natural, the canonical density, if you will, related to LT of W as a density, as a certain distribution on the simplex. So I'm sorry, uh, delta D is the simplex of, uh, of distributions over the outcomes. I, I should have said it explicitly. So PT of W, is simply a renormalized distribution. So, so it's, it's, it's a proper probability density. So it's uh, this exponential, I, I write that it's proportional to this exponential, but I don't write the proportionality constant. And then consider the algorithm that plays WT plus one, which simply is average over this distribution. So in other words, instead of playing the mode of this distribution, I will play the average, the expectation. And somehow I will take into account also portfolios with small probabilities, meaning uh, with large, this kind of loss estimates, with large current losses, but hoping that this kind of losses, uh, I shouldn't completely discard this portfolio. So in a sense, I'm kind of hedging for them. 
okay? And this is like the intuition why this might be formed. On the other hand, I'm probably, uh, you know, if my distribution is unimodal, which it is because the uh, LT of W is con convex. So uh, so this is, uh, so it's a log concave distribution. So at least it's unimodal. So mod should not be that far from the average, from the expectation. So I kind of have some hope that kind of, you know, in the kind of reasonable scenario, I will not be that far from this follow the leader approach that, itself, as we have seen, makes some sense intuitively. Okay, so this is kind of the idea. Uh, there are some other ways to explain why this would work. Uh, so good portfolio is stable. So uh, um, we kind of trying to find, uh, you know, the in this averaging, we kind of trying to, um, oh, that's probably not the most intuitive explanation. So we'll skip it for a second for a change. So. Now, let me state the guarantee. A any questions so far right now? Hello? Um, can I, can anybody hear me? Yes. Yeah, yes. You can yeah, continue. Okay. You sure, can sure. continue. Okay. okay, so now, Carlos algorithm. So uh, for that algorithm, what is the guarantee? The guarantee is very strong. Uh, it's uh, nearly horizon independent. Uh, so the regret of this algorithm is d log d log t, essentially. Okay. So uh, by the way, there is no constant here, even. Um, and you can prove that this result is, in a sense, minimax. So there is uh, a bad market uh, strategy. So the bad adversarial strategy. So the strategy of the market, uh, not necessarily a uh, particular sequence, but the sequence might be adaptive with respect to what the market uh, sees uh, as our WTs, but there is there is a way to break it. Okay? Uh, and uh, giving up to a constant factor this regret. Uh, so it's very strong. Uh, the regret almost doesn't depend on T, only logarithmically. It, it, it does not depend on any in any way on the magnitudes of XTs. So somehow, uh, somehow, if XTs has very large or very small magnitudes, uh, that means that essentially not or it 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 will only hurt the performance of this algorithm together with the performance of the best possible strategy, in some sense. Um, and uh, the dependence on D is linear, which is in some sense intuitively as good as we could hope for, because that means that we kind of have to explore. Uh, uh, all sets only once and not more, so only a constant number of times. Um, oh, I'm sorry, skipped over, shouldn't have. Yeah, so, um, and it's unimprovable at least when T is bigger than D. The problem here, and this is where we, we started with, what we started with, uh, was that it's computationally prohibitive. Uh, so the reason is that, uh, you know, the way, so this expectation, uh, it's not computed, explic computed explicitly, of course. Um, and um, so, you know, when we play this WT plus one and cover Zogan, we have to, to take the expectation over certain log and cave distribution in high dimensions, which is not easy. It's not to be itself a notorious problem. And long story short, uh, Kalai and Impala were the guys who like, uh, who finally, you know, who said, okay, so let's, let's write what we have. Uh, so let's see what guarantees we have. If we implement approximately covered algorithm by performing this kind of uh, sampling from a log concave distribution, this can be understood in, in several, like in two ways. So one way is that you say, okay, this is some integral, and I approximate it by Monte Carlo, by a smart Monte Carlo strategy. Another way is to say, okay, so instead of playing covered algorithm, I will play, uh, I will sample from this distribution. So instead of of, of uh, playing its expectation, I will play empirical expectation with some sample size. So in some, in some way, there's two ways of thinking about it are equivalent and the guarantee you get uh, polynomial, which is a great point. So, uh, but they are not really computationally available, computationally feasible. So the line of Impala in 202, they managed to do this. So they managed to do runtime for one round uh, of uh, O of D for T 14. Uh, this is the runtime to compute uh, the next portfolio in each round, so that the overall regret guarantee is the same as in the vanilla covers algorithm up to a constant. Okay, so and then uh, that was it. So essentially, after after that contribution, people gave up on trying to 
uh, on trying to get, uh, well, at least in terms of the published literature that we have, uh, on trying to get optimal regret. So to match the regret of Carvel's algorithm while having something really non-prohibitive in terms of the computational complexity. Uh, except that, okay, so this could be slightly improved using more recent results on local cave sampling, but I'm telling you that this exponents, uh, they, they don't get better. Like for example, T14 doesn't get better than uh, like T like seven at least. Okay, so like this improvements, although they might be dramatic compared to this one, they simply, they are nothing near uh, what would be computationally really available. Uh, and even D4, if I don't know that if D4 can be improved actually, but anyway. So here's the open problem that we really wanted to tackle. Propose a regret optimal counterpart of Carver's algorithm. So give this regret guarantee in the same assumptions. So in the same, so it should be universal algorithm for these guarantees, but such that it, it is computationally feasible. Now, let me give a very, very brief outline of, you know, of what, what has been done before. So here's like on the left, you have a particular algorithm. They are grouped in like a few groups that I will discuss in a second what they mean. All these algorithms are universal. Um, and uh, uh, so first you have a bound under regret that we have a theoretically proven bound only guarantees with uh, only algorithms with, with, uh, with, um, theoretical guarantees with worst case theoretical guarantees are included here in this comparison. So next column is the runtime per round. So for like updating your portfolio. Uh, so, uh, and you see that first of all, so let's analyze what is written. First of all, all guarantees for the regret before, before our contribution are, are inferior. Um, and this is the way in which they are inferior. Uh, so first of all, there is a first group of algorithms that were like the first historically group of uh, efficient algorithms. Um, starting from, uh, well, it was a, this overlooked work of Feinbold, of Feinbold uh, and, but really like, I would say that the seminal, like the really breakthrough contribution here was this work, Hazan and others, uh, that was the first one to give uh, T nearly independent regret. So the regret that is right and T, uh, uh, so which is online Newton step. An algorithm essentially does Newton step at each iteration. Uh, and it was possible to prove that uh, the regret scales linearly with D kind of like linearly with D, we will discuss it in a second, where's the problem here, and it's T independent. Uh, whereas other algorithms have a way better complexity, only D, uh, they are essentially first order methods, online gradient descent and exponenti exponentiated gradient. Uh, whereas like exponentially graded can be thought of really like the right version of online gradient descent for the right geometry, the right proximal geometry. But the point is that this algorithm, they suffer from sublinear regret, uh, sub, um, sorry, uh, super constant regret. Okay, so square uh, one over square root of, uh, square, sorry, square root of T regret. Now, what is G here? And what is the problem with these algorithms? All these algorithms, uh, they, depend actually they do rely on the norm. So they have, they, they assume that the gradients of the loss are bounded. So uh, by some constant G, by some parameter G uh, and the regret bound depends on this G, uh, which is uh, that puts additional assumptions. So that's really put us out of the universal framework. And these people realize that. Uh, and uh, the, uh, you know, in some sense, a lot of activity of subsequent activity was uh, was centered, was focused on getting rid of this G uh, even by the price of some extra D factor. So in some sense, you can think about this G gradient bound uh, as itself depending on D in some sense. Uh, it's kind of like the right intuition to think about it is if you think about uh, distribution stochastic setup, then uh, you know it's, it's kind of like the same uh, flavor of, let's say, of thing as, as uh, you know, the, the, um, the norm of the Gaussian vector uh, being roughly square root of D. So in some way, in some sense, you can kind of make this to argue that this G can be at least as small as square root of D. So uh, there is kind of some, you know, hidden uh, independence of G from D here. Um, but anyway, so I'm sorry. Uh, 
So the point is that uh, this barrier has been overcome only recently. Uh, and there was a similar contribution from Haipeng Lua from, uh, from here, from I think from the computer science department. So, uh, uh, so in, in like a few years ago, uh, he managed to uh, he managed to introduce the algorithm uh, that was uh, independent from both with the regret independent from both T and and capital G. And moreover, there was some notion of computational portability in this algorithm. So the guarantee were slightly worse than what we what than for our approach. But unfortunately, it turns out that there is a last well the, the new barrier that appears is that it turns out getting that getting from D square is really something challenging while preserving computation tractability. So in some way, this kind of extra D was a way to, you know, to somehow again account for the norm of the gradient, but in the right defined invariant way. Uh, and it turns out that this D square is something, uh, something that is technically not easy to overcome and requires some really, uh, new ideas. Uh, then the two subsequent works are very, very recent. Uh, we have reason, uh, I have reason to expect that in both cases, the authors were kind of targeted, uh, targeted at a similar kind of results that we achieved, namely to get optimal regret. Uh, one reason for that is that there was a well-known circulated open problem node uh, from 2000, called 2019. Uh, that was essentially phrasing up this problem, but for a particular algorithm. So these people assume that some approach, some very simple approach will get, uh, uh, will solve our problem. Uh, one of these two papers, so the authors are, were very well aware of this, uh, and one of them actually disproved this conjecture. So for that simple algorithm, they proved that the regret guarantees are inferior to those. Um, so what they did manage to do, though, is to improve uh, the around complexity of Lua's algorithm so that it becomes capital T independent, which is what uh, practitioners would be very much interested in because that means that you can compute your, you can update your portfolio in nearly constant time. Okay. So, and in some sense, this D cube uh, is what we would like, what, what we would like to have because D cube uh, is kind of like the cost of a Newton step with a sketch Hessian matrix. So essentially, you know that if you consider linear regression version of this problem, uh, where uh, the Hessian of your risk does not, does not depend on the point of interest, then uh, it will, there, there is like a natural way to sketch it so that instead of uh, capital T rounds, you're like always have like effective D rounds that kind of like tra track the relevant, uh, the relevant D assets. Uh, and then D cube is kind of the, the cost of inverting such a fashion, very roughly. Uh, and so like, if you, if you hope to take into account the curvature somehow, then you, you, are, you, have to, uh, you have to spend at least D cube because you have to kind of uh, compute some, some notion of Newton's step at each iteration. Uh, but uh, so, yeah, so, this, so thus D cube for like anything regret optimal D cube is, Essentially, as as good as we hope to get, in terms of the in terms of the complexity per round, uh, what I just said is not is is it's it's a heuristic. Okay, we don't have computational lower bounds, unfortunately. Uh, just anticipating this question, but I do suspect it very strongly to be true. But anyway, so these folks managed to optimize to accelerate uh, regret suboptimal, although with a very favorable guarantees guarantee D cube. Um, Log star, by the way, means polylog. It's a polylog rate effect. Uh, with complexity, D cube. Now, finally, our contribution is that we managed to get optimal regret guarantee with complexity D squared T. D squared T is worse than D cube, arguably, as soon as T is bigger than D, which, is, which should be the case for all these guarantees to be like actually to be optimal. Well, on the other hand, it's dramatically better than this, and it's dramatically better than anything you could achieve by sim. And it, in fact, it's even better than the complexity for, for Lua's approach that we had like a few years ago. Now, let me try to venture into, you know, explaining what, where the algorithms come from and like some very basic intuition about those techniques. Um, 
Well, probably let's discuss, let's have a brief discussion if you want right now at this point. Like I'm 40 minutes into the talk. I can afford this, I think. I, I want to ask a question just philosophically. So yes. here, here we are worried that the T is large. Yes, T is too big, yes. It's not too big. It just has to be bigger than Z. So it's actually, but, in the sense, as small as it as, as it's interesting to imagine. But if T is not that large, then you don't care. It's log T or well, first of all, uh, or square like root of for T. you. Well, yeah, and that's why I just put log star. I really don't care. So the only reason when the only uh, the only setup where you care where it's like uh -huh. log or log square is when T is exponentially large in Z. In this case, logarithms becomes not negligible, uh, but like otherwise, if T is polynomial in Z, let's say with any polynomial degree, then you really don't care. Like if T grows as D power 20, I really don't care whether it's log or log square. So, I really so, don't care. Well, okay, from the practical perspective for such large, I, I might care actually, but you know, at least as a theoretician, I really don't care whether yeah, my constant is 20 or like, you no. Know, let, let's say in your mind, what are approximately the value of D and the T? So what's D, what's T? Yeah, so um, you uh, I can, yeah, I can tell you. So usually this stuff is tested on D uh, like up to like starting from like, let's say like several tens or like a hundred. Mm -hmm. uh, and probably it's in the range of like at most thousands because the you, re, you really need to, uh, like essentially anything which is not plain regret suboptimal, but like very bad regret, like here, uh, it should be at least D cube. And so you should be able to invert matrices of the size D, D times D, which is but, kind of, you know. So, so D in the range of like tens of thousands is not, is not realistic probably, uh, well, on a laptop, but like D up to a thousand is realistic on a laptop, I would and say. The and the T, uh, and the T? And T, as, at least as large as D. Uh, in okay. practice, it can probably be smaller, but it shouldn't be way too smaller. It should scale at least as a constant times D. Okay, that it comes to my question. So it's 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 more philosophical about the model. Yes. But because as a baseline is uh, we are assuming compare with uh, fixed fixed uh, W. Yes. yes. It's a static. Yes. But if yes. T large, is that a really yes. a good benchmark? Oh, to that's compare? a good point. That's a good point. So, because what you're saying is that in practice, uh, like the a market will be reasonably modeled with, uh, with like not a stationary distribution, but like yeah, a trend. Yeah. yeah so, uh, probably not. In short, probably not. Uh, and that's a good point. And probably you need some other models, but this is probably not in the focus of this of this work. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, but usually uh, in my mind, when T is small, let's just do it. Whatever. But T is large. Assume everything is stationary. Just uh, yes. Yeah, okay, I know. So it's like, you know, large and small are like two extremes. The question, and you know, you have a whole world in between. So that that's, mm -hmm. uh, I can tell you that this stuff is, uh, well, okay. Yeah, I, I, I understand. So what you say is that your argument, your argumentation applies over zero when C is like polynomial agency. But as I said, so it's kind of like, to me, orth orthogonal question, but uh, we can discuss more offline, but really at this point, I really have to present the approach. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. Um, Thank you. Okay. So, um, by the way, just just uh, just wondering because I don't see the 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 avatar. So, who was it asking the question? If I may ask, Jim Fong. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. Now I see you. Uh, yeah. So, um, okay. So, stepping stone to understand to explain what's going on. Okay. The stepping stone was what we call LB FTRL. So, first of all, what is FTRL? Uh, FTL is follow the leader this kind of simple naive strategy. Now, FTRL is the jargon that people use in online learning when they say, instead of uh, always uh, uh, following the leader, we will follow the regularized leader. So instead of minimizing this uh, uh, squiggly LT of W, we will minimize the straight LT of W, uh, which like stratifies LT of W by adding a regularization term like to enforce some stability. The question is really what this regularization term uh, and in LBFTRL, uh, what has been proposed 
it's kind of like an old thing essentially, but uh, it was like well phrased in the open note. Uh, this open note by Van Erwen, like by some people from, from Amsterdam, Van Erwen and others know them. Uh, they said, okay, so let's add the logarithmic Bayer, R of W. It's just the sum of, uh, so essentially this is just like natural Bayer function uh, for the simplex. No, well, actually even for the order. So you say, okay, so you take the sum of minus logs of, uh, of the i entries of W, uh, this will prohibit Ws to go uh, very close to the boundary of your simplex. And it's known actually in investment theory and in this portfolio problems from some other works that in a sense, optimal solution cannot be too close to the boundary. So if the asset is really uh, behaves as it's like really cheap, you really should better just discard it. Or at least you don't lose much if you discard it. Uh, so this is kind of the motivation, the practical motivation. On the other hand, another motivation is that uh, this enforces some stability because R of W does not depend on T. This term doesn't depend on T. On the other hand, it kind of like, uh, uh, kind of like the, the augments the loss with kind of getting uh, virtual assets EIs, uh, virtual kind of rounds where only each asset was shown individually, okay? Which kind of also makes intuitive sense and it kind of also motivates why T is bigger than Z. Uh, so like if T is bigger than Z, we can just like afford this without paying so much in the regret, okay? Uh, and then, so the, this uh, uh, hypothesis uh, by Van Eren, the conjecture was that actually the regret you get that you might prove that the regret for this is optimal, surprisingly. Uh, now, why was why this would have been a wonderful result if it would be true? Well, because it's uh, this is really easy to minimize. So, computing the strategy is minimizing this function. This function is not only convex; it's in fact a very well structured convex function. It's called uh, what is called self-concordant, uh, which I will not go into details here. Uh, but self-concordance is a notion from the theory of entire point methods. So, essentially, self-concordant functions uh, can be easily minimized by Newton's method with uh, worst case guarantees, with quadratic conversions, um, like with all the nice things. Unfortunately, it was recently disproved. Uh, and I will not again go into detail, but how, like what is the actual result, but essentially for very large T, and attention, I, I allow here for very large T because it's a lower bound, it's not an upper bound. So it says that at least for very large T, things can really get screwed for this algorithm. So the regret is lower bounded, uh, by this, at least for some sequence. So up to some log and log logs, uh, it's like two power Z. Wait, this log and log logs become polynomial in Z, by the way, but not an, nonetheless. So the point is that there is no polynomial dependency on Z and the regret of this algorithm, at least. So let's see it. With this vanilla LBFTRL, we are done. Uh, still, first of all, the updates are fast. The updates here are only O of D squared T which is essentially the price of a Newton step uh, to compute the minimum of this function. Why the Newton step? It's because Newton's, uh, Newton's method is naturally suited for minimizing functions of this, for these properties, the self-concordant functions. Um, self-concordant functions essentially are those with control third derivatives. So you can do local quadratic expansions um, properly. So, um, and also there is some motivation behind it. So it really tries, it starts with FTRL. It tries to kind of stabilize it. And you know, in a sense covers the algorithm also in a way tries to stabilize it. And we will see in a second, uh, a more precise explanation, what like how, how covers algorithm does it in a couple of slides. This is what I will finish with today. But, but so this also tries to stabilize vanilla, vanilla FTL, vanilla follow the leader. Maybe it's kind of almost what we need. So it turns out that there is a way to make it work. So after a long struggling, we found out this way. And here's the way. Our algorithm is called VBFTRL. So LBFTRL stands for the log barrier of serial. VBFTRL stands for the volumetric barrier of serial. So here's how we cure LBFTRL. So let's say LT of W is uh, your lambda regularized. By the way, I, I skipped that here. I regularize not by RW, but RW related by some regularization penalty term lambda. This lambda is a positive parameter to be chosen later. 
But like in our context, it will be a constant, like a numeric constant, specific numeric constant. So, okay, so given uh, this regularized uh, uh, LT of W, current loss, consider function VT of W, VT of W is a uh, volumetric regularizer, it's this function, one half of the log of the logarithmic determinant uh, of the Hessian of LT of W. This is also called the volumetric barrier. So this function is related to the, uh, essentially it's the log volume of the Zikin ellipsoid of this function, but we'll not go into this. But the point is that functions of this form were known. Uh, uh, we rediscovered this actually, we rediscovered this form of the function in the context of our problem. We were not aware first of all of the usage of this function, uh, of this specific you know, function in the context of interior point methods, uh, but we discovered it afterwards. Um, so in a sense, uh, this is um, function is, is a natural object, this kind of barrier. It's called a barrier because it's kind of explodes on the boundary of the simplex. Why it does? Well, because uh, LT contains R, the regularizer, the logarithmic regularizer, which, which already explodes. And this thing explodes, explodes a, a, a fortiori. Um, but it was known that there is some context where this is the right function to be used on polytopes when minimizing linear functions on polytopes. In particular, it was actually proposed by Vadi in, in 89 uh, as a self-concordant barrier for LPs with improved parameters. So concordance uh, improved compared to the nature to the simple like log barrier. Uh, funny thing is that in the context in which Vadi proposed it, it was known to be suboptimal. And it's actually known, uh, I, I, I had some you know, ongoing work on this stuff. So it's known that uh, Vadi's you know, volumetric barrier in the context, in general context of LPs, of linear programs, it doesn't give you optimal result for the notion of optimalities these folks are looking for. But finally, in our context, it is enough. Okay, so here's the algorithm. The algorithm is simply to minimize LT of W regularized by VT of W. It's of W again reweighted by some mu, so it's the second regularization parameter. Again, the two of them will be constants, but I can run the algorithm for any two values than the mu. It's just that the guarantees I will state they will be for particular constants. So uh, two comments here. First of all, uh, it turns out that this, and it's actually known from the works of Vida, this is not already a trivial statement to prove. This is non-trivial and involves some, some kind of uh, quite non-trivial algebra actually, uh, but this function is again self-concordant. And so it's again, easy to minimize by Newton's method. Like actually I, I can tell you that for unprepared folks, uh, it's usually not even obvious. And to me, for example, it wasn't right away obvious uh, that this function is convex in W. Nonetheless, it is like self-concordant functions are in particular convex and it's actually even strictly convex. So, uh, but not only it is convex, uh, it is also very well structured convex. So you can still do your Newton's algorithm. And this is why the complexity, the stated uh, runtime of D squared T go around. Uh, so yeah, so this is pretty much, that gives you the complexity. Now in terms of the regret guarantee, so let me state the result. Um, so the result is that this algorithm VBFTRL, if you choose, well, we, we, you know, things should be properly done with specific constant values. So in particular, if lambda is 16 and mu is 6.5, uh, then the regret you get is this. So up to a constant is d log t. I'm sorry. So it's long story short, it solves the open problem in the sense that it's a regret optimal algorithm, which is computationally cheap. Well, it's definitely computationally feasible uh, into a dramatically larger, uh, wider range of DNT. Um, and it's essentially, there is still a final computational bear as I see it to, over, to overcome, which is to improve D squared T to D, D cube, uh, which we will discuss in some in very, very cursorily in the end. So uh, again, so why D squared T per round? Well, D squared T is just the, cost of converting a Hessian without sketching. And it turns out that uh, sketching here is highly non-trivial and uh, I, I'm not sure that it can be done. Uh, we tried to do it 
we try to do it. It seems to be a, a deep problem by itself. Um, questions here? Questions here? Like, if uh, can I move? Should I move? I need like a couple more minutes, and we will proceed to questions. Yeah, yeah probably. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. So yeah, so uh, let me very briefly. So okay, so there are two things, and I have probably to choose one. Um, well, if okay, so if I'm if I have five minutes, I can do go over two, and we will be completely covered. Um, yeah, yeah, sure. Okay. No problem. Okay, thank you. So. First of all, let me explain, uh, you know, post factum, in hindsight, uh, we actually retraced how, uh, how this algorithm is related to Carver's algorithm. Can be actually viewed as, a, as an approximation of Carver's algorithm. Remarkably, this was not our intuition at all. Um, so, um, but there is this connection. So, namely, so if you look at Carver's algorithm, uh, uh, because of this exponential leveraging, it's kind of well known uh, that you can rephrase the following thing that the distribution T, um, so it should be PT, I'm sorry, but again, this, uh, the one chosen at step T or like T plus one now, the point is that this distribution can be thought itself, uh, the one from which you play the next portfolio, the expectation over which is the next portfolio. So this distribution is, uh, can be written in this form. So you, you minimize over all possible distributions over the simplex, so distributions of portfolios, distributions that that uh, sample from sampling from which gives you a particular portfolio itself a distribution. So over size distributions, you minimize the expected observed loss uh, with entropy regularizer H of P, where H is the differential entropy. Okay, so minus expected log of the density. Now uh, LT is self-concordant. It turns out. So concordant functions are those admitting nice quadratic approximations that are locally quadratic in the right sense. Uh, so in particular, uh, you can show, and this is this kind of, I, I, I'm not going to explain it right now here, it's, it's a separate talk, but long story short is that for such functions, you can, uh, in a sense, replace, in the right sense, you can replace this function with its second order Taylor expansion uh, in the set, uh, uh, in the neighborhood of its of its minimizer, uh, and it's a convex function, uh, a strictly convex function, so the minimizer is actually unique. And the neighborhood is the right neighborhood itself. It's uh, this Deacon ellipsoid. This is the name of the neighborhood. It's the unit ball, uh, uh, the unit ball uh, in the metric of the Hessian itself of this function. So it's kind of like a right uh, self-characterized quadratic approximation quadratic approximation with right accuracy in, in intrinsic, intrinsic terms. Now, uh, but that means because the distribution you play uh, is, the, uh, is the, you know, the exponential of minus L, that means that this distribution locally is Gaussian in the right sense. So let's minimize over Gaussian distributions it's instead. And then magic, uh, you maximize over Gaussian distributions uh, the maximization, sorry, minimize, uh, minimization becomes parametric. It decouples for the average and for the uh, covariance. Uh, then essentially the covariance uh, uh, minimization gives you this uh, log determinant sector precisely. Okay, and the mean, uh, the, the, the changing the mean of the distribution uh, relates to just changing the next WT because, uh, because what you play is the average. Now, what I'm saying, it, it looks plausible and it's like a bunch of intuition, but actually there were like several steps here that require some like hardcore technique, not like very hardcore, but it's there quite known to you. So the proof really does take like, you know, several full pages of, of technical calculations. So anyway, um, and actually the proof, uh, speaking about the proof for a couple of minutes, it doesn't pre proceed upon like along the scheme. So I, I, I like maybe now we could try reworking the proof along these lines, but uh, I'm not, I don't see it as trivial even. Instead, so our, our, uh, our proof actually kind of mimics and then like repairs the analysis of regularized FTRL. And like argues that this regularizer is the right one that kills like the, the exploding terms and the regret. So uh, 
I will, I mean, I have very probably, I have a very few chance to really to communicate this to you uh, right now because of the time restriction, uh, restriction, but let me just do my best, like very on a very high level, describe what we do. So first of all, there is a standard step of telescoping when analyzing uh, regret of FTRL type algorithms, or like what is referred to FTRL analysis. Uh, so uh, where essentially you subtract, uh, you add up and subtract the minimizer of, uh, of if L, uh, L tilde T is your the approximation, it's like your surrogate loss that you minimize at each round with the regularizers. Uh, then essentially by subtracting and adding and subtracting these minimums with increasing T, uh, you can upper bound the regret uh, in this way. Uh, then using the optimality conditions, uh, your regret decouples uh, at the sum of three terms. One term that I call the bias term, the last term. It's easy to analyze. It's essentially the term saying how much you lose because of your regularization. And hopefully if regularization is reasonable, you will not lose much too much. And essentially this term will be upper bounded by the regret bound you're aiming to prove. And it turns out this is the case here and it's really easy. Now, there are two other terms. One term is like the FTRL analysis, but like FTRL, uh, it's kind of like follow the leader, but for the, uh, for the surrogate loss instead of the actual loss. So this is what I call the leg term. Uh, and this kind of, this is the sum of term where every time you kind of leg because you take the next, uh, the, the previous minimizer instead of the next one. And this is why like, it's kind of why the algorithm keeps losing um, all the time. It's kind of like where FTLL, it's exactly the point that broke the usual vanilla FTL because it was kind of always laid by one step, by one row. But then uh, the next term that arises because of this optimality condition is actually the upset term that kind of mends you, like repairs you, it helps you uh, because it like uh, shows you that uh, the regret is decreased by the judiciously chosen regularization term. Now that's kind of, now the hope is that here this offset will kind of kill the extra terms that appear in the lecture. And with some technical analysis for which I'm completely like, I don't have any time right now to go over it, but essentially using some concordance, some tricks uh, and some analysis for leverage scores uh, known in the context of general regression, uh, it turns out to be possible to prove uh, the right bound for the upset term. So, uh, and this is, so now there are some perspectives. I, I'm, uh, I'm out of the time. We can discuss them as you will, or we can, I can, uh, I can proceed answering your questions. Thanks. Thank you for your attention. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any more questions? Actually, I'm just curious about that word, the, the volumetric, what does that mean? Does oh that... yeah, so um, consider, consider an object. So you have a strictly convex function, okay? Let's say it has, I mean, it either has like no minimizer. So let's say it has one minimizer. It's not a pathological strictly convex function, okay? Uh, so you look at this minimizer. Oh, actually, uh, I'm sorry, you don't even have to do it at the minimizer, but let's say for simplicity, we do it in the minimizer. Now, uh, I know that uh, my function is locally quadratic. Uh, if it's like smooth enough, right? And it's strictly convex, that means that at, this, at the minimum, the first order term will vanish. So my function will be locally a parabola. Mm -hmm. The problem is that how local? It's like Taylor expansions and symptotic theory only tells me that, you know, completely local. Okay. Now, uh, but maybe I want to have something strong. Maybe I want to have that a statement like, okay, if I move around my minimizer uh, in some neighborhood that it's not vanishing, uh, then uh, in some sense, my quadratic approximation uh, will be stable. Okay. So it turns out that self concordant functions are such functions and Dick and ellipsoids of so this ball that I mentioned. So first of all, the definition of the Dick and ellipsoid uh, I, I mean, uh, I can write, but for this, I need to connect the iPad. So, well, okay. So I can just like pronounce it, I think in English. So uh, consider uh, local, consider metric uh, in this point, uh, which is the usual Euclidean metric, mm -hmm. uh, but the transform Euclidean metric with the linear transformation uh, given by the square root of your Hessian. 
So that means that instead of measuring the norms uh, at this point uh, the, in the usual Euclidean way, just like the, you know, the square root of x i, the sum of x i square, you first you multiply x i by the, essentially you, you take the geometry given by your function itself, by the second order Taylor expansion of your function itself at this point. Okay. okay. This is kind of, you define this local norm. And uh, taking the square root allocation is completely natural because it's an affine invariant way. It's the right, it's the right power. Okay? Now, uh, Zikin ellipsoid is simply the unit ball. Zikin ellipsoid at any point, actually, x for your function f uh, is the unit ball uh, of x, like around x, uh, for this metric, the metric defined by the Hessian again at x. This is the definition. Okay. Thank you. It's an ellipsoid because I take the square root of the, my matrix, right? So yeah. I take the squared norm of AX for this, or like H one half X. But the thing is that self-concordant functions in a nutshell are functions uh, such that in the unit Zikin ellipsoid, the quadratic approximation, the Hessian uh, changes slowly in the right in a suitable sense. Uh, it's actually, you can prove that for self-concordant functions, the Hessian uh, uh, becomes distorted up to a constant factor at most. Uh, distorted in a positive semi-definite sense. So it's like, it's so eigenvalues become, they, they are like distorted by at most a multiplicative constant. Like that's one of the properties that is convenient. Did that answer your question? Uh, yeah, thank you. <laughs> okay, we can also discuss offline. Also, if I'm given another minute, I can just like show the, because- We I, can, I we can do this after- yeah. The, Sure. Yeah. The, we usually have a post-talk uh gathering we can probably continue discussion continue i would be glad to discussing. yeah okay so the the whole thing do you um is there any similarity of, between the algorithm with the, the kind of reinforcement learning by oh, uh, looking at that's... the the, the uh... distribution yeah, so uh, that's, I actually, you're, you're, so this is a, a good question. I'm usually, I'm kind of like, for a good question, I have already answer. But in this case, I don't. I, first of all, I'm really not a specialist on reinforcement, on reinforcement learning. Uh, and uh, moreover, I'm actually wasn't a specialist on online learning before doing this stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm more from the usual like optimization and statistic community. Uh, statistics, but um, what I can tell you that uh, in terms of the intuitions, there is there are some you know common ideas, common themes that are used. This kind of hedging idea, this kind of exploration versus exploitation, although it's not as crystallized here. There are some algorithms in bandits, uh, for example, in bandit optimization, where this kind of exploration and exploitation uh, <clears throat> is kind of more like clearly separate. So, like I would say that you know. Here, this is not a problem with linear with limited feedback. That's one thing to understand. Reinforcement learning is limited feedback. Uh, limited feedback plus unknown policy that you have to, mm. to teach, right? To, to learn. Uh, here, there is no linear limited feedback. So it's further from reinforcement learning, arguably, than, for example, uh, online linear, uh, than, online, than linear bandits. That's another problem I mentioned here, or like online linear optimization with bandit feedback. Uh, although we actually hope to attack this problem in the future because it has a similar kind of gap between uh, between uh, uh, statistical uh, well sorry regret optimality and, and stability. Um, but otherwise yeah I mean this hedging idea is kind of when you have to not completely discard the right uh, solution there should be something like that in, in, in reinforcement learning but I don't know uh, for sure. But uh, so yes, yeah, so one thing is that the techniques that we used and even the particular technical tools, technical approaches, uh, mm -hmm. they, I, I highly anticipate them to be, uh, to be useful, first of all, in this problem. Mm -hmm. And second to like variations of portfolio problem that are actually related to quantum computation. This is called quantum portfolios that, that has been recently introduced a year ago. Um, like it's a very natural framework where essentially instead of W you play uh, <laughs> like your W instead of the distribution becomes a kind of like a quantum matrix. It's like a unit trace matrix, PSD matrix. Um, so like uh, 
instead of playing pure states, you're playing like mixed states in a sense. And then it turns out that some of the regret analysis techniques they carry carry through to this setup. Um, yep. Okay. Just a thought, just a, some kind of feel. Sure. <laughs> yeah, okay. So other questions? Thank you. If not, then uh, I will stop recording and we'll probably take a short break if you wanna Stay. We we can come back and have more discussion. Uh, as you as you guys want. I I I can do it. Uh, uh, if there are more questions, I can discuss. Yeah. Okay. So let me stop the recording first. Thank you.